Well, it depends on how close I am to God. Well, there was a young man who was sent off to college by his dad. Just before he left the house, his dad said, everything that you need, son, is in this book. You know? It's kind of like when our kids left the house, I'd say, remember whose child you are. Not because I was worried about them messing up the name of Michael Howard. I messed that up years ago. But remember, you're a child of God. And so there was something that, that had substance to it to, to receive. Well, the boy would call him every month, and then it got to be where he'd call him every week, and he'd say, Dad, um, I appreciate what you gave me, but I need some help. I need some financial help. I don't have enough money for food. And the dad said, I gave you everything that you need. Everything that you need, you already have. And the boy would call again, and the dad would say, I gave you everything you need. Finally, the boy was so down and out, he was scraping bottom so bad that he finally turned to the Lord, and he opened that Bible, and what did he find? Tucked in the midst of that Bible ever so often was $100 bills. Oh. And the dad thought, if you would put your mind in the right place, you'd realize that everything you need. Now, the lesson was real clear. If he would have turned to the Lord sooner or just gave God the glory or the thanks, then he would have received the things that he needed to make it through that semester. And a good lesson was learned. I'm sorry, I don't have a Bible for (laughs) y'all if you go off to college. But I was thinking about that. You know, as Simon Peter was laying out that first book that we took since June to walk through, as we walked through 1 Peter, um, he told them, I know you're suffering, I know you're going through trials, I know you're going to go through more trials, this is the way to make it through. And then when he started his second book, he started with giving them, equipping them with what they needed. In fact, in verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, everything that you need for life and godliness is found in him who calls us to his own glory, who calls us by his own glory, and both those things would be good. So, if he was going to give tools or everything that they need, uh, what tools would you give? If you're going to give somebody spiritual tools that were going to walk them through life, how would you equip them? Well, we had this baby dedication for a little baby Annie, beautiful little baby girl. How do we equip her, Michael? How do, we, how do we help her to grow up? How do we learn ourselves how to grow up? How do we know God's will? And how can we know that we receive from God a guarantee from heaven? You see, in the last verse, last two verses of what we're going to see today, God gives a guarantee. He says, if you do these things, and the promise from God is you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome. Come in close to that. A spiritually and a physically rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What does it mean to store up treasure in heaven? I don't know. I know that he gives us some ways, but the treasure, I'm not sure what all it is. I know that it means there's treasure in heaven, and I know that this says there will be a rich welcome for you. The question is, are you building upon a foundation that that is is something that is a prophet, or are you not? There's a passage in First Peter, I mean First Corinthians chapter three, starting in verse eleven, that says, No man can lay any foundation other than the foundation that's laid in Jesus Christ. So if you think that you're going to be able to be profitable on this earth long term, or if you think that you're going to be able to stand before the Father in heaven one day and him say, well done, you have to start with one thing, and that is you start with your faith in Jesus Christ. Like Heath was talking about a while ago, it has to be personal. And that scripture in 1 Corinthians 3 says, nobody can lay any foundation other than the one laid in Jesus Christ. He is the only foundation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except through him. And then it says, now if a man builds on this foundation, it's like Jesus is just the start. He is the foundation. But we're to build on that foundation, and we build on that foundation either with things that are of value to God or things that are not of value to God. Men, share with me some of the things that have been not of value to God that you've built. No, don't do that because that would be embarrassing. And I would have to share with you some of mine. The fact is we all have things that we've done that are not of eternal value, things that make God want to turn his face because of our sin or because of our, our hurt or because of our stubbornness or our pride or something else. But what we're talking about today are things that are of good value. What Peter was laying out were things of good value. Now that passage in 1 Corinthians says, No one can lay any foundation other than the one laid in Jesus Christ. Now if a man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, things of value, or wood, hay, or straw, things that are temporal, 
His work will be shown for what it is. When we stand before the Lord, the things that we've done for God, and you won't stand before the Lord if you don't have a foundation in Jesus Christ. It is only through Him. But if we have that foundation, then He says build on that. Today I'm going to give you the tools to build on that uh, with a confirmation from God that in glory we will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of the reign of Christ, the Savior Jesus Christ. Now if you build on this foundation with gold, silver, or costly stones, it's a value to God. If you build with wood, hay, or straw, what what happens to wood, hay, or straw if it goes through a fire? It burns up. It's consumed. All of your ungodly actions, all of your selfish, all of your self-fulfilling things that are of no value to God are going to be of no value to you in heaven. Those would be things like wood, hay, or straw. The scripture says there will be a fire in heaven. It says it in a bunch of different places. And you go, what, Michael, fire in heaven? Remember the scripture talks about in Revelation 1 how Jesus Christ's eyes are like a flame of fire. Hmm. Well, is that literal fire, Michael? Is there a match up there? No, it's not. He uses the term fire like it's something purifying. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah took tongs from off of an altar that had fire on it, and with those, didn't take tongs, with the tongs, they took a live coal, a burning coal, off of the altar in heaven where God was, where the, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and all of the beauty of the things that Isaiah 6 talks about. So there is something purifying in heaven, and the way that it's explained to us in earthly terms so we can understand is fire. So if your works are things that are only of earthly value, but no heavenly value, they're explained as wood, hay, and straw. And one day at the judgment seat of Christ, those things are going to go ahead and go away like ashes. But the things that we've done for God, uh, encouraging one another, lifting up the children, walking them through life, serving, not expecting anything in return. The things you've done for God like that, the worship that you just did is like gold to God. It's like the, it's like the precious things that God has in store for us one day. Because we gave back to Him, you have something yet to come in glory. And the more that we do that, the more our life starts to reflect Him. And we're going to see how the reflection uh, talks about in a second. So if our works are wood, hay, and straw, or if our works are gold, silver, and costly stones, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 3 that the fire will test the quality of each man's work. And it may be like the purifying eyes of Christ. The fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he'll receive his reward in heaven, if it's like gold, silver, and costly stones. If it is burned up, listen close to this, he will suffer loss in heaven. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Hmm. Read it in 1 Corinthians 11. I mean, 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 11. Still being saved, being saved, but missing out on something in glory. Yes. I don't know what all that means. I'm telling you, it does mean that, and it does matter. Which means, based upon the way we serve, there are opportunities of service in glory. Based upon the way we store up treasures in heaven, Jesus said that himself, I didn't make it up, there are treasures to be received in heaven. That's the facts. Now, how can we do that? Uh, it seems like the hardest thing to figure out, how can I be approved of God because I've got so much garbage in me? How can my mind be of any value to God because I've got so many garbage thoughts that go through my mind and that control me at different times? This passage is the equipping passage. That's why I was telling you at the beginning of the service, if I could equip you, if I could take you, if I had one opportunity to share with you one passage for all of my life, this is the passage I would share with you if you know Jesus already. If you do not know Christ, what passage would I probably take you to? John chapter 14, verse 6. Let me tell you about glory, and Jesus is the only way to get there. No one comes to the Father except by him. These are, in my perspective, at this stage of my understanding, the most important things in life. And if I can help you understand three of seven items found in 2 Peter chapter 1, only the first three, then the promise of God, the guarantee of God is going to be yours in heaven. It's not hard. So if I were going to equip a ranch hand, what, would it, what does a ranch hand need in order to be a good ranch hand? A horse? <laughs> Y'all didn't say that, I just said that. He needs a saddle. Uh, today he may need a four-wheeler. Cattle would help. He needs some tools. If a carpenter is going to be a good carpenter, what does he need? What? A saw? What else? Hammer? If a mechanic is going to be a good mechanic, what does he need? 
a hammer. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> he would need a wrench. He would need a socket set. There's some good mechanics in our church, and there's some good carpenters also. And all I know is that whenever I've tried to do mechanic in work, I needed a hammer. All right. If a pastor is going to be a good pastor, and I'll make it personal to me and let you know that this will apply to you also, but if a, if a preacher is going to be a good preacher, what does he need to do that? Give me a Bible. What else? A spiritual mind. Excellent. What else? What? He needs God. He needs knowledge. Do what? Compassion. What? <laughs> he needs the internet so he can study. What else? Patience, faith, and people, love. And if his mind is full of pornography, would that be good? So where does he need to start? Purifying himself. The first place he needs to start is purifying himself because if he doesn't do that first, and I struggle with that, but if I don't do that first, then there's nothing for me in the Word because all I see is my sin and I can't get past that. So when I start to purify myself, then all of a sudden the Word starts to be opened up and it would do that for you also. And then the thing that I struggle with the most is what? What do y'all y'all think I struggle with the most? Sin? Okay, what else? What? Overeating? <laughs> Can you believe she said that? You are so right, Miss Alice. That is one of the many things I struggle with the most. I can eat most of you people over the table any day. I wouldn't say under the table because that's a drinking thing. But All right. Um, but that's not what I struggle with the most. Well, it fits in this. The third thing on our list that we're going to look at today is self-control. Thank you, Miss Alice. That applies to self-control. But there are many things that apply to self-control. And that's where I struggle the most and probably... If you have purified your mind or you attempt to do that daily, it's a daily thing to purify your mind, by the way, because Satan knows which things are going to turn your head. Satan knows which things are going to uh, oppress your spirit, which things are going to set you off. And so if I can keep my mind daily in an attitude of Jesus washing it out, and it needs to be done like that. That's why Jesus washed the disciples' feet, because they'd been in touch with the world. Well, we're in touch with the world all the time, and we need that washing all the time. So... The first three things written in our scripture we're going to look at today, the first one is virtue or goodness or purity. The second one is intellectual knowledge, growing intellectually, not a relational thing, but an intellectual knowledge. In other words, getting to know what is in this book. It's a bulletin. <laughs> no, it's the rest of the stuff that's in the book that matters. Getting to know what is intellectually in this book. And then the third thing is self-control. Now, if you do those first three things, only those first three things, then you are not only on the right track, you, if you do those things today and you do those things tomorrow, the fourth thing listed that we're going to read in a second applies to you. And the fourth thing is perseverance or patience. It means that if you persevere in that today and you go, oh no, I've got more garbage in my mind, Lord, please cleanse my mind. Focus me and make my day fruitful. Make it, make it be of something of value to you. And you persevere in that, then you already got the fourth thing. The fifth thing is godliness. If you know, of, and I've asked you these things before. I've bumped on this passage before, but to start off Second Peter, I needed to start off with it. But if you know of a godly man or a godly woman, probably, unless you are a bad judge of character, they are one that does their best to purify their mind, to grow in the knowledge of the Word, and to uh, maintain self-control, and they persevere in that. It doesn't mean they're perfect. It means they try. They try every day. They persevere in that. And the fifth thing is godliness. The sixth thing is brotherly kindness, and that means I have something to offer to my Christian brother and sister. You do this whenever you love on somebody who's in the hospital, whenever you love on families like Jerry and Tony Butler's family as they walk through the loss of a mom. You do this when you walk through life together, and that's brotherly kindness. And the seventh thing, the last thing in the list is, does anybody know already? Love. And the King James Version uses the word charity. Charity means to give something and expect nothing in return to give something that will benefit somebody else self-sacrificially. The word love there is the word agape, and it means that I self-sacrificially want to give to you. I expect nothing in return, but I want to give. Charity means we have something to give to the world, but if we don't have the sixth thing, which is that brotherly kindness, brother to brother, if I've got a problem with one of my brothers or one of my sisters, then I'm going to fail probably in the last thing to give out 
freely to anybody else because I've still got this thing that I'm holding against the one who is my brother. Take out your scripture and let's look at these things. I shared those things in relation to how uh, a pastor ought to walk, and I stumble sometimes, but how a pastor ought to walk, but the things we're going to look at today are not just applicable to me, they're applicable to us. And the promise from God is that if we will do these things as individuals, if I will do, if you will do these things, then you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now Satan is coming at us, and Satan is coming at us with, with tools. He is coming at us like we are at war. And the old devil does not want you to be equipped with the things that I'm sharing with you today. He does not want you to, to know that it's real simple. He doesn't want you to know that if you're one of those that says, I don't know God's will, how can I know God's will? Do three simple things. Purify your heart, grow in the knowledge, read the word, and then do your best to maintain self-control. Then you will know and you'll be used of God. You will know his will and be used of God. The things that are listed today are just so important. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting verse 1-11. through 11. If we have a soldier that goes off to war, before they go off to war, we start to equip them. What is the most um, crucial uh, tool that they receive? Do what? Training. That's exactly right. It's not their gun. It's not their sword. It's not their food packs. Uh, it's, it's training to have your mind fixed. It's training to be able to do the right logical thing at the right logical time. It's training to walk in obedience to the one who is the commander-in-chief. And that's what Peter was doing in the midst of this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1-11 through 11 says, starting in verse 1, Simon Peter, the author, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, and we walked through that in quite a bit of detail, and we'll touch on it in chapter 3 later on. Not today, but later on in the, in the uh, months ahead. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, it's to you, to who, through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, through his grace, through his gifts, you have received a faith as precious as ours. Verse 1 says this book is to saved individuals. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, listen close, but it's not applicable yet. Until you say, Jesus, I want you to forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I want to know that because of you, I have an opportunity for heaven. I give my life to you. This passage is to saved individuals who have already accepted Christ. Verse 2 says, grace and peace will be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace are going to grow and build up in you. It's already given to us, but it will be multiplied to you. If you know of somebody and see somebody that I said a while ago is a godly individual, they are a person who has grace that gives graciously to other people because they've received graciously from God. But they also have peace, a peace that goes beyond understanding. Why? Because they have a handle on life? Because they have all their bills completely paid? Because they're physically in good shape and they don't have a cancer or a broken bone or something else? It has nothing to do with earthly things. This peace is a peace that comes from God. And grace and peace will be yours multiplied if you will, if you will have a relationship with God. Now there's the word knowledge is found four times in the, in the verses that we're going to look at today. Three of the times, it is not just intellectual knowledge. Now it's, it's maybe found five times, but three of the times, it's not intellectual knowledge. It is a relational knowledge, which means it's a, it's a, a different Greek word than the intellectual knowledge. If I, was say, if I said, young people, y'all need to... Get your learning done. <laughs> I'm sorry, I struggled with that. If I, y'all need to, y'all need to uh, grow in 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 knowledge in history or in math or in something else, social studies or whatever. I'm sorry, I didn't go to school. <laughs> but if you will do that, then you'll get good grades. That's an intellectual knowledge. Let me tell you what: if you grow in the intellectual knowledge of this word, then you will have. Uh, one of the pieces that it takes to have a relationship. Can you get to know Jesus without getting to know his word? It seems to be an impossibility. The devil will tell you, God's bigger than the Bible. You don't have to read the, not, the Bible to be spiritual. And he will lie to you and tell you that this is not important. 
the scripture today tells us this is the second step of importance. First purifying yourself and then growing that intellectual knowledge. But the knowledge in this verse right here is not talking about intellectual knowledge. It's talking about a relational knowledge. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, if you want to write down this verse, Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 says, For this very reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Being filled with the knowledge of His will, it's the same word that's found there that is found in this, these three spots I'm going to share with you in a second. It is a relational knowledge. I know you and I love you because I have a relationship with you, because you are my family. I um, know of some other people. I have an intellectual knowledge of them, but I don't have a relationship with them. And the scripture is telling us here we have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Get to know him. And he's going to tell us how to get to know him. He's going to give us seven simple steps of which you only have to do the first three and then keep doing the first three to the best of your ability. Grace and peace will be yours in abundance through a relational knowledge, a relationship of, with God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then verse 3 says, In fact, God's divine power, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge, this relational knowledge, relational knowledge with Him or of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Jesus never sinned, though He was born into a body that had inherited a sin nature, meant that He was born into a body that did not glow like God. Those that uh, could be without sin are still born into a sinful nature here. How do I know this? Because Adam and Eve, when they sinned and fell short of the glory of God, they lost something. They lost something that had to do with something that, that somehow glowed God. Moses, when he was on the, uh, on the uh, Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, when he came down, the people said, Oh, you are, your face is glowing. And, and his face was glowing God because he had been so close to him. Just being in close relationship with him. The glory that is yet to be restored to us because we've sinned and fallen short of the glory is going to be given to us and one day white raiment will be given to us to wear. In other words, a white, a white covering from God. That's the glory of God. Jesus said, let me show you on the Mount of Transfiguration what a glorified body looks like. He said, some of, some of you will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in His glory. And He took Peter, James, and John with Him, the writer of this book, and He showed them a glorified body. And it said His face shone like the sun. Uh, his clothes were as bright as lightning. That's what is yet to come for us. But it's going to be in a spiritual sense. From a human sense, we go, I can't even look at it. It would be like you trying to look at the brightest light that's ever found on this earth and just stare into it, and you'll end up with those dots that float around in your eyeballs. But in this situation, we're going to all be in glorified bodies. We're going to be reflecting God. It's an amazing thing that is yet to come. But this is going to come because of Jesus never sinning and falling short of the glory and giving his life for us. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, it uses the term to his glory. And that's why I want you to know that this word by or to here in, in, uh, in this verse, in other words, could be translated like this. Everything we need for life and godliness comes through our knowledge of him who called us to his own glory. He's called us to his glory. He's called us through or by his glory. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, it says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, himself will restore you. Now that's all the preparation of the beginning that we have here. So, if I were a wealthy dad, really wealthy, and I had a son or a daughter, and I wanted to make sure that they had everything that they needed for being successful in life, so I bought them a farm, uh, one of the most uh, useful, fertile farms. The, the fields were already cleared. The ground was rich. I bought them a house so they could live right there on the farm. And also I got them the biggest, best, most expensive, powerful John Deere tractor with the implements to, to, to match it. Now I know some of you are not John Deere people and just picked that one right out of the sky. If I bought them the biggest tractor and, and, and I promised them that there would be irrigation systems out there for the years that it didn't rain, which means you can always have a crop on this land. And I gave them the keys to that tractor and I said, 
son or daughter, I want you to have a good life. And I stepped away from them. And then a few years later, I came back just to get a progress report on how they're doing. And the keys were sitting right there where I handed it to them and they set them down. They never even started the tractor. Would that be smart? What would that be? Dumb. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly what I was thinking and I appreciate you sharing that. It would be dumb. Listen, what I'm giving you today is a guarantee from God. What I'm equipping with you today, not because of what I have to offer, but what Peter shared with us today is a wealth. It's the wealth of eternal glory. It's a farm in heaven that he said, if you'll just do your best to use the tools I've given you, you're going to bear fruit. But if you don't do this, you're going to be unfruitful. You'll be unproductive. You'll be ineffective. I'm telling you, uh, the dumb will be written on your forehead when you're standing for the Lord if you don't follow three simple steps. It's not hard. Let's look at the passages there. Verse 4 says, Through these seven qualities that we're going to talk about in just a second, and I'm not going to dwell on them. I'm going to just share them with you, and I'm going to leave them in your care. But through these seven qualities, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, these seven steps, of which you only need to do three, you may participate in the God's nature, in the divine nature. You may be a partaker of or fellowship in God's nature, and you will escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, come in close, this is it. For this very reason, if you've got a foundation in Jesus Christ, just like we talked about, add to your faith. Now here's the ignorant side of things. Some people say, Jesus, I do receive your gift of eternal life. I trust you as my Lord and Savior. And then the old devil says, now you've got to clean up your life. Or worse than that, you've got to clean up your life before you come to Jesus. God doesn't say you have to use your own abilities at all. It's like somebody saying, uh, well, God saved me, now i got to change me. You don't have to rely on your own abilities. He's given you the tractor. He's given you the tools. He's given you the land to bear fruit. All we have to do is apply three simple steps. I love this. He said, the foundation is Jesus Christ. Make every effort now to start building on that foundation. Add to your faith. Add to your faith. Why do we have to add to our faith if it was complete in Jesus Christ? If he said it is finished and I've done everything I'm supposed to do, why do we have to add to our faith? Because we've got a responsibility. And in James chapter 2, it says in verse 17, faith, like he said, faith without your actions or faith without works is dead. And it says in the end of that chapter, it says, like a body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works. Now, if there was a body laying up here, and they were dead, they were not breathing anymore, their heart has turned off, if the body was laying here, would you say that there was a body here? Yes. I'll just help you with that. If you poke it with an ice pick, is it still a body? Does it say, ouch? No. Sorry, if that wasn't trying to be morbid or ugly. Or... Listen, if your faith is without action, it's still faith like the body laying here but it's of no value. It doesn't mean you weren't saved. It means you're saved but suffer loss, like I read in 1 Corinthians 3. Faith without works is like a body with no value. It is separated and turned off from God because it's chosen to be separated in that way. So because of this, add to your faith. The first thing is what? Say it. Goodness or purity. The first thing, add to your faith. Start by purifying yourself. You're going to stumble in this every day. If you don't, then you're, you've believed a lie from the devil. If you don't stumble in this, if Satan doesn't try to blindside you with things you never expected to see coming, then, then you're, you're un- desensitized somehow. You've forgotten that you were cleansed from your past sins. You've already been bought uh, into Satan's old world here. But if you'll do your best to purify your mind every day, men and women and children then the first thing will be in place. Virtue is what the King James Version says. What does it mean? Avoid doing wrong and do right. Or if you want to see it in a positive way, do right, do the right thing, and just avoid doing the wrong thing. That's what goodness means. That's what purity is. That's what keeping your mind focused on good things. To goodness, add knowledge. Now, this is not that relational knowledge. This is intellectual knowledge, which means I must spend time, as you are today, and I commend you for it, listening to the Word, reading the Word, studying the Word, or dwelling on the Word. So, 
you're doing this second thing already today. Now, if you've come in and you've got a bunch of sin in your heart and on your mind, then you're going to be limited in what you receive. But if you just say, God, purify me. Use me as your vessel. And I have to do this every Sunday. And in fact, I have to do this throughout the week. But on Sundays, I just say, God, I know the garbage that runs through and the things that I see and think and all this stuff. And I need you to use me as a vessel of honor. And Lord, I just need you to empty out the, the garbage that, that Satan wants to throw into our head. The second thing is knowledge. And then you will grow in the intellectual knowledge of God's Word. It's a great history book. It's an amazing science book. The details we can give to you are details that you could find also yourself, and I can help you be equipped with those things. We had 21 men and 60 women or whatever this past week involved in Bible studies. You're doing that. It's a great thing. The third thing says, and to knowledge, self-control. Not being out of control. Have you ever been out of control? Yes, thank you. I have too. And it's at those times that I need to uh, pray that, the, the, that I will be obedient enough to step back in and say, oh, I remember what the Word said about that. I can control this. Lord, I give you control of my mind and my heart once again. I don't want to be out of control. Out of control means sin every time. There's a scripture that says, be angry. Did you know that? It's okay. It says, be angry. And then it says, and sin not. See, anger was given to us as a protection, as a provision, to be angry against the things that are not of God, to be angry against the things that are an abomination to God. But we can be angry and sin not. The problem of being out of self-control is when we get angry, then all of a sudden there is stuff broken. Hearts, relationships, dishes. I've never broken a dish on purpose like that. Add to knowledge. Did anybody just get punched in the side? Don't raise your hand. Add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, intellectual knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control. Now, if you'll just do those first three things, own those, memorize them, hang on to them, chew them up, and spiritually use them every day, they will be your sustenance. If you do these things and you'll persevere in them, then the fifth thing will be godliness. And people will look at your life and say, there's a man, there's a lady that I would like to pattern some of my life after those godly qualities. The sixth thing is brotherly kindness. It's the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It says Christian brother, Christian sister, brother and sister to brother and sister. We have something to offer. The kindness is what we offer to them. And the last thing is add to brotherly kindness, love, or charity. See, if I have something to offer to my brothers here, then I'll have something to offer to the world. There are some churches that get in such a, a fight that they become ineffective and unproductive. And, and, the, and God can't use them anymore. Why? Because they've got problems with their brothers and sisters, which means their charity, their love is not being shown at all. You may know people who, when they go out to eat, all the... And, and it's, it's, ever so often there's things where people may rub against one another like brothers and sisters do sometimes, but those things are not important because the blood that ties us together is thicker than the, the garbage of the world, which means that we circle around and sometimes people will circle out, but they circle back in because there's a purity here because we desire that. Some churches seem to feed off of the conflict. The next verse is all about that. Verse 8 says, "For if well, verse 9 rather, Verse 8 says, if you possess these good qualities, virtues, in increasing measure, you try to do your best over and over and they grow in you, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. And here's that relational knowledge again. Not intellectual, but relational with Christ. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. In your relational knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For what it's worth, the... Greek word for intellectual knowledge is gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. These words that I've told you have to do with relationships are epignosis. It's a greater knowledge. It's, a, it's an intimate knowledge, a knowledge of, of love, a knowledge of relationship. And that's what we need with Jesus Christ. If we, however, are backbiting, if we are somebody who is not pure in mind, if we're somebody who's not growing in the Word, then we do not possess these qualities and we become ineffective and unproductive like a, a lazy gelding horse <laughs> he's lazy which means he's not doing any work and he's a gelding which means there's going to be no fruit from his life there will be no more horses come from that feller and that's what it means for us to be dead ineffective faithless we haven't added to our faith we're of no value if we're lazy and we're 
But if we exude Christ and do the best that we can to, to just take care of ourselves, then God will give us ministry to take care of other things. Because you are faithful in a few things, he says, I'll make you ruler over many. Well done is what the desire that one day God would say to each one of you. That's my heart and his heart too. Verse 9 says, Now if any of you do not have these qualities, if you refuse to purify yourself, then you will be limited in your intellectual knowledge of the word and you will always struggle with self-control, which means you don't have these qualities. If anyone does not have these qualities, if you don't add to your faith, he is nearsighted and blind. It means he can't see far off and he can't see up close. He's nearsighted and he's blind and he has forgotten. Listen to this. He has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. He was saved but is suffering loss because of his just not doing three simple things. Purifying his heart, studying the word, and maintaining self-control. He has been cleansed from his past sins. He forgot about it. Because he got his mind fixed on garbage stuff. Remember, this is written to saved people. He already has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, verse 10 says, Therefore, my brothers, I want you to be all the more eager, all the more eager to make your calling and your election sure. I'm going to talk more about this uh, possibly next week. Probably next week I'll start with this verse. But be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never fall. And I'll share with you what the calling and election means. And the promise, verse 11, you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A guarantee from God? You can hang on to that forever. Now the guarantees that God has for us our guarantees from the Father above. Do you think God ever lied? The answer is no. He never lied. Now listen, we're going to have fellowship with Jesus here for a second. The knowledge, the relational knowledge is something that starts with a springboard. Jesus got all of his disciples together in an upper room just before he went to be betrayed and then to be killed on our behalf. And he shared with them the last tools that he wanted them to have and wanted them to know. He said, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember my sacrifice. He didn't necessarily say, I want you to remember the cross, but I want you to remember what took place at the cross. It was my sinless life that gave life for you. It's like somebody who is on death row for murdering a whole bunch of people, and then somebody else comes in and says, I'll die so that that person can live. That took place, you know. That took place. I don't know if Barabbas was just a thief or if he also was a murderer, but he deserved death. And the first person that Jesus pardoned of his sin or was pardoned on behalf of Christ was this one. Give us Barabbas. Give us the one who was supposed to die. Put this man who is sinless in his place. And Barabbas could have been your name or my name. If I was there, I could have been the one dying and Jesus died on my behalf. So when he was in that upper room, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 26, and, and after I read these words, I want the men to come up, but I want you all to hear these words first. Paul said, What I received from the Lord I'm passing on to you. And sitting at Jesus' table, not at my table or yours, or the church's table, this is at Jesus' table, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he gave thanks for it, he broke it, he passed it out to the people, and he said, this is my body, it's broken for you. When you take this, do it in remembrance of the price that I paid. Do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant, the old one is obsolete. And this cup is representing of the blood, my blood that was shed. Whenever you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. It didn't say it is me. It says it's in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The first guarantee God gave to us was that if we'd put our faith in Jesus Christ, we would have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish ever but have everlasting life. And for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, now there is... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those men who are going to come up from our Bible study who 
would help pass this out, come on this direction. I'm going to pass these things out to you, and then we're going to have prayer in a moment, and and then we'll take uh, all together. We'll we'll partake of of what Jesus did with the men. He said, "Now take this," and um and as soon as we pass these things out, then we'll have prayer. So I ask that right now you open your heart and say, "Lord, I need to start the first step. I need you to forgive me. I need you to purify me. I want to start with those first three steps by asking that you'll cleanse this cup, this old vessel of the garbage that's inside."
had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me On the cruel cross He suffered from the curse to set me free Communion means having fellowship with Him oh, sing and in taking of the Lord's Supper we celebrate His sacrifice and His life the fellowship with the his blood, when Jesus had passed out those things, he had to pray together. On the Father, cross, I thank you so much for being our Savior. He sealed my pardon. No one in this room. He the is, dead is worthy of being chosen by you, free. being called by you, worthy of your sacrificial life. But we're very, very, very great. I and will we tell the wondrous story of those things to come. How my lost estate to, to save. He gave thanks. It says he passed it out. And he says, This is my body, which is broken love and mercy. Do this. Take it and remember it. He the ransom freely gave. Sing, oh, sing. My Redeemer, with His blood, He purchased me on the cross. He sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will praise my dear Redeemer, His triumphant power I'll tell, how the victory He giveth over sin and death and hell. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer, his blood, he purchased me on the cross. He sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood, he purchased me on the cross. He sealed my part, paid the debt, and made me free. He paid the debt with his blood. Wow. Thank you. 
not pass me by Let me at a throne of mercy Find a sweet relief Kneeling there in deep contrition Help my unbelief symbolic of my body and my blood so we'll remember why we'll remember who we'll remember the sacrifice that was given and what was yet to come